My name is Liz Hadley, and I'm, I have the honor of being the chair of the, this year's Senate, the 50th anniversary Senate chair. I'm, it's a pretty great honor. And I'm, I'd like to welcome you to this meeting that's sponsored by the Stanford Historical Society, and, and it marks the 50th anniversary of our incredible Senate, um, and also the publication of a book um, devoted to the history of the Senate. So what we're going to do today is hear from a, an esteemed panel, and you'll have an opportunity to ask them some questions, and uh, we can uh, have a nice discussion about the Senate. Our first speaker is Peter Stansky. He's the professor, a professor of history emeritus who's written part of the book devoted to the general history of the Senate. Each of our four panelists will then speak very briefly so that there's going to be time for former chairs and participants in the Senate this year to make comments, and also, I hope, for some time for, for discussion, as I said. Peter. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will attempt to be uh, coherent, but it's sometimes a challenge for me. <laughs> uh, the, uh, this event, which is uh, one of the uh, official meetings of, of the Stanford, Stanford Historical Society, uh, is, but it, it, its purpose is to launch launched this book. This is the official publication day of the book. Hans Weiler was very, uh, followed old fashioned publication rules that copies were not generally available except to a select few until this very day. And now, and, and now they're very much available and though, uh, there, uh, and there are copies outside <laughs> that uh, I strongly urge you to purchase for the reasonable price of $20, a nice $20 bill, so we <laughs> avoid credit cards or checks, uh, but you can do checks, uh, which includes tax. So this is available for anybody who might wish it today, the publication day. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Hans Weiler, who's very much involved, wrote the preface and very much involved with the uh, creation of this book and this book coming into existence. Uh, he's in Germany. He, uh, he, he couldn't be here. He will, however, as, as you may know, on, on uh, May 17th, the meeting of the Academic Council uh, will, uh, will be uh, devoted with Nan Cohane and uh, a very distinguished educator from South Africa uh, who did his PhD here uh, will, will, will be the speakers on faculty governance today. This is a meeting of the Historical Society, and hence <coughs> it's about faculty. Uh, it's, 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 it's looking at the past. <coughs> so this book is devoted to the past 49 years of, 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 the, of the Senate. Now, now in its in its fiftieth the fiftieth Senate with Liz as its chair is is is, is meeting. Uh, there was the essence of the of the of, of the book. I think is well conveyed. There's a very small two case exhibition which I turn uh, uh, call your attention to uh, that Daniel Hartwig has has created in 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 the library. Uh, there also is a story in uh, today's in the Stanford Report. Unfortunately, I had two minor errors. I had no, nothing to do with this book other than writing the history of the, the first part of it. Uh, I wasn't the co-editor. Susan Schofield was the magnificent editor um, mm -hmm. uh, of the book. She's the editor. It also, for reasons that elude me, uh, <coughs> said that, said that um, uh, uh, that I was responsible to the, for the famous roast section. There's the traditional annual roast of a chair uh, are reprinted in the book. I, had not, uh, I don't know whether Susan or maybe Tom also or Hans. Uh, my only involvement in the book was, was uh, the first hundred pages. Uh, but also, I should mention, since this is the event of the Historical Society, that, that the Historical Society has been published with a subven generous subvention uh, from from the, Stan the Bob Byers Fund of of uh, the, the stamp, which is not noted in the book, from the Stanford Historical Society, and uh, one's grateful 
to Richard Cottle, the chair of the Publications Committee, and the, the, the Stanford Historical Society for their support. And I should mention that Susan, well, maybe I'll mention it when I introduce her. I'll put that, put that off. Now, uh, I, I, I tried in a sartorial way uh, to, uh, to suggest uh, the history of the Senate, in that I'm wearing, a, unusually, I'm wearing a white shirt. And as you notice, the, the, the one on the, the, uh, the, uh, the <laughs> photo on the front has these white men in white shirts and ties. Yep. <laughs> but uh, but, but uh, there were two, uh, well, anyway, uh, eventually. But if you turn it over, you get a more modern view. Chair. What? If you turn to the back, you I'm get a more modern view. I'm not wearing a tie, and I feel that <laughs> represents the Senate today in, 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 uh, on the back, uh, back of the book. But just, just extremely... Uh, extremely briefly, uh, the, the, the first meeting of the Senate was uh, chaired by Leonard Schiff, was uh, September 12, 1968. As probably most of you know, and I should mention that I'm speaking, there are a lot of people here who know as much, if not more, about the Senate than I do. And also, as I say in, in my text, this is the first time I've written anything as a historian, as a participant observer. And I also try and give myself an escape route in which I say I have chosen, <laughs> I have chosen what to write about uh, based on the minutes of the Senate. And, and uh, no historical text is without error. And fortunately or unfortunately, there are a lot of people here who know a lot about the Senate. <laughs> and so uh, you may, well, I guess I, guess I want to know if you see errors. <laughs> I don't know if there'll be a second edition. And, but also, uh, almost that, more significant, I've chosen what to write about. And, and uh, I say it's a personal choice. Uh, I don't, and others might feel that I should have paid more attention to this rather than that. And, and uh, particularly budgets, which, as I say, Wally Falcon said, I never don't, told me I never understood budgets, which of course is true. Um, and and uh, the provost always makes a magnificent uh, uh, presentation of the budget, which is very, very important. But just very briefly, as you probably know, Stanford was sort of a, a, a was ruled by the president, Mrs. Stanford, until, until um, uh, 1904. Uh, and, and then, it, for a series of upsets, uh, there, there, there was the creation of the Academic Council, which has a rather misleading name in the sense that Council suggests it's a rather small body, but in fact, as you all know, it's the tenured and tenured line faculty. And, by, uh, and, that, uh, and so there was a very large faculty governance group, the Academic Council, and there was a very tiny faculty governance group uh, consisting of seven elected and two co-opted people. It may have changed how it worked from called the executive committee. But clearly, the, the, as you probably all know, the, the impulse, there was a double impulse. And Herb, uh, uh, Herb Packer, uh, professor of law, uh, was very much the driving force. In, and by, in 1966, he was proposing that there should be an, uh, a, a Senate, a representative body. Stanford was moving from being a very prominent, uh, had, had moved from being a very prominent regional university to a, uni a university of national and international standing. The faculty was expanding tremendously. The resources was expanding fantastically. The problems of, of the academic and research problems were expanding tremendously. And even, and then of course, it wasn't directly caused, but obviously that was a factor. As you all know, that was the period of political turmoil. And so how, and, and the Academic Council was having these endless meetings to cope with, with uh, the famous meeting where Dick Lyman and Herb Packer said, this isn't working. And I think that, that, well, it's a long story, which is discussed a bit in the text, uh, uh, that there had to be another body. And that really, the, the political situation and the, just the general history of the university, the two, there were two, it seems to me these were the two major factors for the establishment um, of the Senate. The paradox, I think, of the Senate, uh, and you may or may not agree, 
is that its central concern is the teaching and research, the traditional concerns of the university. And that's what it spends most of its time. It hears these reports, it approves these reports, it's sometimes bored by the reports, it sometimes comments extensively more than it should, but it's very helpful. Of course, the Senate, and uh, you know, we, 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 I, I must terminate soon, but in a minute or so. But, but the Senate, the, the wonderful thing about the Senate, it represents the entire universities, so you get different points of view. But, but the drama of the Senate, the rather, to me, the rather paradoxical drama of the Senate is the, dr the dramatic stories are when they're periods of political turmoil. So, so the hot stories, so to speak, are uh, uh, classified research, the Vietnam War, the great six-year saga, which of course Craig and David Abernathy were very much involved in, of, 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 of the Reagan Library, uh, political issues sort of get the press. And the Senate's participation in, 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 in the political issues is, uh, is, is tremendously important. But in a funny sort of way, it's not, it's, it's a part of what it does. But its central mission is, it seems to me, and I don't know if you people will agree, it's, its central mission is, is the traditional concerns of a university, teaching and research. And that's, that's what the Senate exists to, uh, um, to dis well, on the basis of extensive committees, endless committees, the standard thing when a problem arose, we'll, we have, we'll have a special committee, we'll create a committee to cope with it. Um, so any case, uh, and of course, you know, I can make further comments, uh, but, but I've, I've sort of said what I wish to say, I think. In, in, in the text. So I, I, I hope, uh, and also the wonderful thing, which is the appropriate uh, segue to our next speaker, is, is in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, what should be the role of the administration? And I think incredibly, and there was, a, at some universities, the president chairs the Senate. And that was a strong possibility here. But it was it was it, it was decided no it would be a faculty member who would be elected elected annually, and the administration the president provost and a certain number of deans and I think there are now fifteen ex officio members and the very nice thing is that the ex officio members sit by chance by the, by their the, their last name. They don't have, they, they, and of course the, the president, provost, and deans are faculty members, but they're also administrators. And they sit in the Senate during the period of their appointment. So they're frequently in the Senate longer, longer than other senators. And they begin by, by, by making announcements of things that the Senate will be interested in, but then they're open to questions. And three heroes of my account, which again you may not agree with, are uh, uh, Ron Rebholtz, um, uh, Bernard Roth, and Rush Rem, who, who were, the, were the agitators and w would ask difficult questions. But, but, but the, 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 the president and the provost were open. And I think uh, it, it, so the relationship between the administration and the faculty in the Senate, I think, works unusually well. And so that's a, a, a very appropriate moment. Uh, I'm very pleased that Gerhard Kasper, uh, who sat in the Senate as president uh, for, for eight years, um, is, is the, the next person, a uh, very distinguished scholar at the University of Chicago, dean and provost, and then of course our president, and, and now a, 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 a professor at the university. I'm very pleased that he's to be the next commentator. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is really a great, great pleasure 
to see so many faces that are so intensely familiar to me and that I have not seen in a long while. It is a great pleasure and I'm very... Now, I apologize for wearing a tie. Now, <laughs> there, are, there are two reasons, really. I knew David Abernathy and David Spiegel would be wearing a tie, so uh, I did not want to kind of be behind them. Uh, and, they, of course, the Dean Pizzo also, but you are lacking the jacket, uh, uh, Phil. Uh, uh, but, you know, during while I was president, and I think it is still the case, uh, tie and jacket are the president's uniform. And uh, my hunch is, I don't know about Mark, but my hunch is Mark is wearing them every day. And uh, so I thought it was appropriate uh, to remind you of my role here to <laughs> appear in tie and coat. Uh, now, I, as I listened uh, to Peter, I was worried that he would say most of the things I had planned to say, and he got a good way towards that. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, so there will be a little repetition, but it is, I think, useful repetition as repetition often is. At the first meeting of the Academic Senate that I attended on October 8, 1992. I realized that the alphabetical seating arrangements that mixes both elected Senate members and ex officio members has the effect of treating the president from the perspective of senators as, in separation of powers terms, not separated. And I think that is a very important one. And of course, separation of powers is one of my specialties in constitutional <laughs> law. So I had to start out by pointing out uh, that this was a really a very powerful step uh, Stanford had taken. Al Hastoff, our former provost, a pioneer in the study of social perception, made a similar point, perhaps even more forcefully, when in September of 1992, he and I were walking across the quad and Hastoff stopped to introduce me to someone. This is Professor Casper. He also serves as president of Stanford <laughs> University. As Herb Packers, uh, Peter mentioned that Herb Packers' proposal for a Senate evolved in 1967, some faculty as well as a board of trustees uh, thought that the president should be the head of the Senate. The executive committee of uh, the Academic Council fortunately did not agree. And due to their insistence, we ended up with a system in which the president and provost, as well as some other administrators, are ex officio non-voting members of the Senate. Now, Peter has written, I quote, the tradition developed early on that the president and provost would at each meeting inform the Senate of items of interest on which they could be queried. Members of the Senate could also ask them questions on topics of concern. The ex officio status of the president and provost made the point that although they themselves were faculty members, they were in this context considered administrators and almost as if they were guests of their faculty colleagues. I disagree with you, Peter. <laughs> I confess that I never considered myself as a guest of uh, the Senate, <laughs> but rather as a colleague with special responsibilities and duties. Throughout my years as president, I actually cherished the sense of colleagueship. While I was a member of the law school faculty, that faculty would probably have been greatly surprised to see me regularly show up at faculty meetings. Thus, the bi-weekly meetings of the Senate were the occasions where I could feel most as an academic among academics. There is a tradition Peter mentioned for the president and provost to answer questions from senators President Lyman was of the view that, I quote, Stanford faculty both then and now have tended not to recognize their unique privilege being able to question the president and provost on any subject with or without notice at every meeting. The question period was of particular importance to a president who was an unknown quantity uh, to the Stanford community. It gave me a chance to be informal, 
to elaborate on my views, to use humor, and occasionally to show emotions. Uh, reading, reading the minutes, uh, I even found one instance where the academic secretary, Marion Lewinstein, uh, noted that my voice, my voice was rising in irritation. <laughs> Donald Kennedy, <laughs> you remember, you seem to remember. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, uh, Donald Kennedy, at the last Senate meeting before he stepped down, remarked, I have heard some things in the Senate that I have not wanted to hear. For better or for worse, it is good for people to hear things that they don't want to hear. For better or for worse. Some faculty members, as, as Peter mentioned, played the role of questioner regularly. In my years, the most outstanding of these was Ron Rappolz. I mean, the most outstanding right. uh, of the English department. Unfailingly gracious, uh, he rarely missed a chance to press his views of what the university should be doing. So much so that Senate life without his comments became hard to imagine. In the last Senate meeting of the 1993-94 academic year, after he had put a question to me and I had answered, I in turn asked Reports, how dare you go on a sabbatical next year? <laughs> With great pleasure, Reports replied. <laughs> <laughs> For the president, the academic senate is the one regular platform available to him for telling his academic colleagues and the campus community what he believes is important to the university. Robert Hutchins once complained that when a university gets too big and complicated, the burden of institutional detail is so great that nobody can think of what the institution is for. The Senate meetings were regularly used by all members of the Senate to deliberate on what the university is for. This was the case not only concerning the core educational and curricular issues that Peter made reference to, but also as to policies on sexual harassment, conflicts of commitment and conflicts uh, of interest, recruitment and retention of women, affirmative action, grading policies, copyright and patents, the medical center. The debates about the Sheehan Commission on Undergraduate Education were a high point of my years as president. I wrote my statement on affirmative action for the Senate. I also used a Senate meeting in 1996 to put forward my views on the synthesis of teachers and students, which led to the introductory seminars and Stanford graduate fellowships. From the vantage point of the Stanford president, one of the most important aspects of the Senate is its institution institutionalization. It is made up of elected representatives of the various faculties. It meets regularly. It has subject matter jurisdiction as to certain academic issues. Its proceedings are characterized by normative forms of behavior. It has committees such as the Planning and Policy Board and those on undergraduate and graduate programs and on research. Put differently, the Senate is not ad hoc. And in many of our competitors, faculty governance is ad hoc. They suddenly come out when there is a crisis with mostly very unforeseen consequences. I was always struck by its great sense of professionalism and cooperation. Its tone was anything other than partisan. As Gail Mahout has put it, in a time when polarization and alienation are rife in public discourse, the Senate can be a bastion and a model and perhaps a refuge for those who wish the world were otherwise." End of quote, Gail. It provides the university with a sense of coherence, of togetherness that is very hard to achieve in a non-communitarian community such as a university. While the Senate is not a democratic legislature that is competent to lay down rules for most activities in the university, it is the only campus-wide public faculty body to which the president can turn 
other than the academic council, not a very practical alternative as the circumstances that surrounded the creation of the Senate in 1968 make clear. To some extent, its availability is one of the most salient aspects of the Senate. Stanford governance has many elements. Governance takes place at the departmental level, at in institutes and centers, in the schools, the advisory board, the academic senate, the academic council, president, provost, management leadership, the board of trustees. The governance system is immensely complex, though it is useful to remind ourselves that the most crucial decisions, the initiation of faculty appointments, the choice of research projects, essential features of the curriculum, and the selection of graduate students are mostly under the control of faculties, because that is where the subject matter expertise lies. In a system of this kind, it is very important to balance decentralized decision-making with central institutions such as the Board of Trustees, the President and Provost, the Advisory Board, the Academic Senate. A university's competitive strength is to a large extent a function of its capacity to combine encouragement and freedom of the multiple pursuits of its faculty and students as they interact with one another with a willingness of everybody at the university to work for its institutional well-being. Generally, it is not enough for a university to be merely a gathering place for bright individuals or groups of individuals. Instead, the members of a university need to think of themselves as members of an institution. The academic senate is one of the means Stanford has developed to make this happen. This is indeed a ground for celebration. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our, our, next, uh, our, our next speaker is Susan Schofield, who, who, who's uniquely qualified uh, to speak. Uh, she's been the editor of, of, of the volume. He's very, I should have mentioned Jeff Wickenden is here. And he's, he's the, the real editor. Hmm? He's the real editor. I'm no, just no, the no, coordinator. He, he, who, who was in charge of the production of, 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 <coughs> of the volume. And I want to thank him. But Susan worked very closely with him. Uh, uh, Susan is, uh, uh, is very much involved with the, the Stanford Historical Society. She's the main figure, uh, uh, one of the one or two main figures, or the main figure in the oral history project. She's been deeply involved with Stanford Historical Society, which is half of, of, of this production in a sense, but also she's been deeply involved with the administration. She's been a dean, and most appropriate uh, for, for, for today, she's a former academic secretary. Uh, the, 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 the crucial figures in, in uh, how can we put it, in giving the chairs a voice. And those who are chairs will know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> so I was the seventh academic secretary in a line of 10, and now Tom Wasso is the 11th. I served from 1996 to 2002, so seven years, with several of you that I see here. I agree, it's a great pleasure to see colleagues back together when you don't get a chance to see them together all that often. Um, my job here, uh, well, I want to say one other thing. I'm a bit of an outlier as an academic secretary because I, my whole career has been as an administrator, as a staff member, but when I looked, I discovered that Don Wimbigler, who is the first academic secretary and served for, I think it was seven or eight years, actually spent 30 of his 35 years. He had a faculty appointment first, but then he became an administrator. So he was the registrar, then he was the <coughs> dean of students, then he was the academic secretary. So I'm not as much of an outlier as I thought I was. But otherwise, academic secretaries have been faculty members, usually emeritus faculty members. Um, so my, my main role here is to sort of take us down to the ground level and talk a little bit about how this complicated 
organization of committees and senates and academic council committees you know it's it's got a lot of moving parts and and what's the academic secretary's office for it's to keep those gears moving um so i'm going to do a little bit of what's behind the scenes uh the academic secretary's office usually has three sometimes four people depending on budgets budget cuts or budget increases um and i want to give a special shout out kudo all of you know trish del pozo she retired a year or a bit more than a year ago um she was just the incredible essence of the academic secretary's office for 30 years she had this unbelievable memory and she didn't just remember facts she remembered nuances who said what and why she thought they said it and she was extraordinary um but i know hans and tom have found ways to move beyond with with adrian and and a great staff but everybody does miss trish um so thinking back to 1968 if you're the academic secretary's office what are your tools your tools really are a typewriter and 3 by 5 cards and i kid you not those 3 by 5 cards were still there during my time trish did not want to give those up <laughs> but most everything now has become computerized of course um and uh it's you know it's a much it's a much easier operation also we've mentioned the white men in white shirts and black ties you know now the the senate is itself much much more diverse I, if i counted correctly there are 24 out of the 56 elect, elected senators in senate 50 that are female so we've come a long way there um so what does the academic secretary's office do principally just i'm going to tick off some things quickly they are the keepers of the historical record obviously um the academic secretary serves as the senate's parliamentarian this is robert's rules it is way too big way too complicated but you do learn it <laughs> you must learn it um though i did after a few years i created a little one page what you might call robert's rules for dummies um and that that tells senate members and us the simple things to how to make a motion when you can defer how you can defer etc so i i think that in ways was a lot better than this big thing but this is the bible um <laughs> do you have one tom no i want your cheat sheet it's on your website <laughs> um so the academic secretary partners basically with each senate chair um helps to support them sitting at a table like this at one floor down um managing the meeting uh dealing with issues counting counting votes etc um and then the academic se secretary basically creates the history by writing the minutes he who writes the minutes creates the history they say um different academic secretaries have written minutes differently uh most people on the campus i think adored art coladarchi's minutes because they were erudite and they had little snide asides about what somebody was wearing and what have you they were quite humorous that i did not see in me <laughs> So my, I spent my time when I wrote minutes and usually it was about 2 days usually over the weekend given the deadlines with the campus report now Stanford report I spent my time trying to sort of condense and make sense of the the thread of discussions and pull people's comments together when they agreed and and what have you but that was my approach and others have approached them differently Um my most embarrassing moment I shall admit before you all because I actually was willing to put it in the book was in the fall of 1997 the senate chair had congratulated Myron Scholes of the business school for having received the Nobel prize in economics you may remember this maybe you don't care hard um so the, we wrote that up in the minutes of course um and then the minutes were reviewed and proofed i'd proofed them but then they went through one last spell check and there was a new version of word and whatever we didn't notice they went to the to the publication they were published and that morning myron schools had become moron schools <laughs> horrifying <laughs> horrifying <laughs> 
So I did apologize immediately at 8.30 in the morning or whenever I was in the office and realized this. And most of the Senate members um, said, oh, it's OK, Susan. And one said something else that I shall not repeat. But in any case, in any case, I thought I must make lemonade out of this lemon. So two weeks later at the next Senate meeting, I had spell checked every Senate member's name, and I'd come up with my favorites. And my two top favorites still are Ramon Saldivar was serving in the Senate. He could be spell-checked, was spell-checked, into romaine salad. <laughs> <laughs> and Lucy Shapiro, who probably didn't appreciate it, became lucky shopper. <laughs> so I, I lived through it. It's 11 years you know, gone now. I, you know, it, it was OK, I think. But it was very mortifying, and we really watched spell check ever since. I actually learned that Dilbert picked up that little that little theme some months or or yeah, some months later. And it the idea was, no, I didn't call you a moron. <laughs> it must have been the spell check. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so the academic secretary's office I think you could sort of see as a maybe a producer of a behind the scenes producer of what becomes Senate meetings, helping to uh, arrange presentations, review supporting documents, work with the steering committee on what's ready for Senate and what's not, um, basically provide a script if the chair wants to use it, organize you know the logistics of meetings. Uh, the secretary, academic secretary's office office also runs elections. So there are elections every year for Senate members and then subsequently for steering committee and chair. Uh, there are also elections for the advisory board, though the academic secretary doesn't support or staff the advisory board. Um, you, you, serve the, you serve ex officio. I served ex officio on the committee on committees. Very soon after I arrived, I said, oh, I have a better idea. We'll call it the nominating committee. No, 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 it's the Committee on Committees tradition. You mustn't change it. So I think it still is the Committee on Committees. But there, there's um, wide representation, and, and faculty are identified, nominated as good people who might be able to join the vacancies, fill the vacancies on committees and chair committees. Then the academic secretary has a big job, which is to convince them to do it. Um, and I felt. I felt like I had pretty good powers of persuasion, but sometimes you have to sneak up on people. Because if they know you're calling, they might not return the call. They know you're going to ask them to do something, and they might not get back to you. But basically, you also had to learn when no was the right answer, when you really wanted somebody to do something, but they were too overcommitted, and it wouldn't be a good idea to have them take the job anyway. Um, those are, those are sort of the key, I think. I mean, I may have skipped a few, but those are the key aspects of supporting behind the scenes the faculty governance. There, there is a lot of interaction with academic council committees that goes on outside the purview of the Senate meetings to make sure they're, they're tackling the issues and, and know how to tackle them. And if they need help, you provide help. Um, so I'd like to end, as each Senate year ends, by mentioning these lovely tributes. The, it's part of the Senate culture, the tributes to the outgoing Senate chair done usually by the steering committee, sometimes just by the vice chair. Um, and they've, they've become incredibly creative, uh, often musical, often poetic. Shakespeare, Gilbert and Sullivan, you name it, they've showed up in the roasts and toasts. I think of Brad Osgood singing to Senate chairs twice. Um, and reciting Mighty Mayhood in the chair to Gail. Uh, I think of the entire steering committee dressing up as Hank Greeley, including wearing Greeley's own sweaters. Uh, I think of the Dr. Seuss-based skit that R Russell Berman was Sam I Hum, not Sam I Am, but a Sam, Sam I Hum, um, in a tall red and white hat uh, in a tribute to Rosemary Knight. And I think of James Campbell singing, I've grown accustomed to her face for Cam Moeller. So they really have become a wonderful part of Senate culture, I think.
I've really enjoyed my seven years, and then I felt it was time to retire. What, what could I do that would be better than that? So I did retire at that time, but I think all academic secretaries have felt very privileged to serve in that role and to support this wonderful institution that is the Senate. So I'll close with a quote from Hans Weiler, who said, if the Senate didn't exist, it should promptly be invented. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, our, our last speaker is Ethan Riss, who, who, who's uh, a faculty member at the University <coughs> of Nevada, Reno. He is a recent uh, PhD uh, from the Stanford School of Education. <coughs> and uh, we're very pleased that he could come and join us today. And he's written a splendid essay in this book uh, about uh, faculty governance at other universities. So he, he provides a, a, a uh, comparative perspective uh, for, for our <coughs> faculty senate. Ethan. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, I have disappointing news, despite what Peter just said. So I, I'm not going to answer the one question that you probably want me to answer. That is, is Stanford's academic senate important beyond <laughs> this campus? Is it, is it exceptional in some way? Is it exemplary? <coughs> or is it fairly typical and unremarkable among faculty governance bodies at American universities? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> what I will tell you is a little bit about the larger landscape of faculty senates, and I'll leave it to you to see where Stanford fits in. So first of all, we're certainly not unique in having a faculty senate. They exist in one form or another at 90% of all four-year institutions in the US, including all but six of the 151 institutions classified as R1 or R2. Now, senates, of course, vary widely. In 2004, James Minor, a higher ed scholar, developed a typology of four prevailing models of faculty governance bodies in the US that may be instructive. So Miner's first type is the functional faculty senate. Now, if you're thinking that functional sounds like damnation by faint praise, you are correct. <laughs> functional senates limit themselves to strictly academic issues like curriculum and standards, but even on those questions, their power is frequently overridden by presidents or boards. They're predominantly passive, responding to an agenda set by the administration, and occasionally they react to perceived threats from the administration directed at the faculty, which is an important function to be sure, but I think we can agree that self-preservation is not the same thing as governance. So as a counterpoint, Minor offers the influential Senate, which is as good as it gets. These bodies play an integral role in running the university <coughs> with authority that stretches well beyond faculty affairs into fundraising, budget allocation, and even the hiring, hiring and retention of senior administrators. These influential senates help set the agenda, including on issues that go beyond academic questions and indeed into questions that are not directly related to faculty welfare. This includes areas like athletics policy and human resources policy. Then at the opposite end of the spectrum are <coughs> ceremonial senates. When these bodies meet, if they meet at all, it's primarily to elect their own officers, and maybe gossip a bit before they adjourn until the next academic year. <laughs> and finally, there are subverted senates, which have the will to power, but are stymied by the administration. This situation arises not necessarily because administrators do not respect faculty voices, but because they choose to work with faculty in more informal ways. In some cases, the subversion happens precisely because the Senate is too active. If the president sees the body as confrontational, she may be inclined to rely instead on a kitchen cabinet of professors to serve as the voice of faculty, while ignoring the Senate and its protestations. So that's one typology that offers a wide range of possibilities. Not everyone buys this. The late Martin Trow, for example, argues that all academic senates are essentially worthless. <laughs> for explanation, he points to the historically strong position of presidents and of trustees. These individuals are jealous of their power and their management expertise, and they're reluctant to share it with the part-time amateurs serving on the senate. 
I quote from Trout, administrators provide managerial information to Senate committees rather selectively, often on what they define as a need-to-know basis. As a result, these committees often do not have enough information to ask the right questions of administrators at the right time, and so they are merely consulted after the basic decisions have already been made. Is that fair? Perhaps. But generalizations can only take us so far. Even typologies lose the nuance that comes from actual cases. So in my chapter, I profile a half dozen faculty senates at peer institutions, showing how dramatically these bodies vary in form and function. So take, for example, our friends across the bay. The differences between Stanford and Berkeley are much deeper than the public-private dichotomy. It's important to remember that Berkeley is not the University of California but rather simply one of 10 campuses of what is legally a single statewide university. So this means that while Berkeley does have its own divisional council for some local faculty governance issues, the real power lies in a 40-person assembly of the academic senate, which represents the entire UC system. That body helps determine issues ranging from tenure and promotion policies to admissions, non-discrimination initiatives, and the approval of new degree programs. So the UC faculty voice is powerful, but individual campus voices are muted. For a very different counterpoint, look across the continent to Columbia. That university senate was created on September 12, 1968, the very same day that the Stanford Senate held its first meeting. But the similarities come to a quick halt. At Columbia, there is no traditional faculty senate. Instead, it has a university senate. This body is more than half professors, but it also includes nine administrators, including the president and provost, who are voting members. And more momentously, 24 of its 108 seats belong to students, both undergraduate and graduate. So think about that. At Columbia University, undergraduate students have some say in tenure and promotion policy. (laughs) But the power keeps flowing up, too. Columbia's 12-person executive committee of the Senate, which includes eight professors and two students, has a formal role in hiring the university's president, provost, and even some of its trustees. So do you see what I said or what I meant earlier about variation in form and function? And then there's Harvard. You knew I was going to discuss Harvard. (laughs) Harvard's faculty faculty senate is particularly notable, particularly interesting, because it doesn't exist. (laughs) And it never has. When when the Harvard faculty famously voted no confidence in President Larry Summers in 2005, that wasn't a resolution passed by a senate or any other representative body. That was a vote of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, which is just one of 15 divisions that make up the university. Of course, Harvard faculty have autonomy and they have power, but that power is always exercised locally at the division level, and it is always dramatically overshadowed by the powerful Harvard Corporation, whose 12 self-perpetuating fellows are by tradition never allowed to be current or former faculty. (coughs) Go figure. So where does all of this leave the faculty senate, both here at Stanford and in a universal sense? In its most exemplary form, the Senate is somewhere in the middle. It exists and it functions, unlike at Harvard, but it is not, as we know, all-powerful. It's not an administrative creature, but it's also not a true representation of the university's constituents. So to that end, it's important for us to remember that the faculty Senate is not modeled on the United States Senate which is elected by the people and endowed with inalienable power by the Constitution. Its model is the Roman Senate, a patrician body without true legislative power. It's undemocratic, it's frequently petty, it's sometimes indulgent, and it's always at risk of being overridden by the consuls or crushed by the emperor. And yet, and yet, it exerts tremendous moral authority and it consistently speaks up for the ideals of the larger community, especially in times of crisis. And while we're on the topic of antiquity, I will end my comments by quoting Archimedes 
in his famous observation about the lever. He said, give me a firm place to stand and I will move the world. The faculty senate is not a lever. Whether it's ceremonial, subverted, influential, regardless of its makeup, regardless of its authority, the Senate is simply not a tool with which one can move the whole world. It is, however, a firm place to stand. And according to Archimedes, that's no less important. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite former Senate chairs and former members of the Senate or present members of the Senate to offer some words to our audience. We are commun- we're members of a community, as uh, Gerhardt said, and that means we're individual members I was struck this morning, in fact, deeply, deeply moved by the picture of Herb Packer. I knew Herb Packer. He was, he, he, the first dinner party I ever went to at Stanford, the Packers invited me. He was a, and you see that man, a young man in this picture, in his absolute prime. Uh, with with a future obviously of leading the university, and he certainly would. You know, he and he and uh, Dick uh, Lyman were chosen to lead the university, and then to see him struck down like that. So, and the this individual created in a way this senate though. He was a a person. And when I think of the chairs here, people that I know or or, um, I still can remember them a little bit, uh, (laughs) I think of them as individual people and community members of the um, institution. These people, you, all of you, your personalities, the sort of thing that made Herb Packer do what he did, are parts, and I just think it's, it's, it's important to remember <coughs> the, uh, the excellence of the members of the university, and uh, I guess we sh- I, I'm trying to pat us on the back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Other comments? Did uh, uh, Peter? Did you mention in the book? I haven't read the no, book. Uh, I haven't read the book yet. Yeah. I haven't. I haven't seen the book yet. Uh, I'm not Jim Comey. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> his stuff gets out whether he wants it to or not. <laughs> but did you mention in your in your introductory history the speech that Herb Packer gave to the uh, 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 the Stanford? Chapter of the AAUP? Uh, no. Uh, 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 I think the, the only mention I have, um, the AAUP, uh, well, I think to our shame, uh, particularly considering that the AAUP was, came out of the, part of it came out of the Roth case on the Stanford faculty, there was, I had reason to try and discover, I, I, I myself a member of the AAUP, and somebody wanted to find out about its archives. 25 members of the Stanford faculty, at least this time, were, were members of our members at least seven years ago of the AAUP. Uh, because we, we uh, 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 many universities it functions as, as a union, and here, here that's not necessary. I think it's rather sad that they're not more members, but that's by the way. But, but I think at the time that the Senate was being established, I think the AAUP was a more c- considerable uh, organization and I know I mentioned that he consulted it, but but I didn't run across. As I say in the beginning, I I, I could have spent years doing this and you know talked to lots of people uh, about it, and perhaps I should have, but but there wasn't time, and and so the account is almost exclusively based on the minutes of, of the Senate, 
And I do have a reference. I mean, uh, can, uh, that, Herb consulted with AAUP, but tell us about. I mean, if you know about this, tell us. I do, and uh, as important as Herb was in creating the Senate, the structure and the and the purposes and and the organization and so on, and he clearly was the key person in that. Uh, he's, in a way, uh, set off the. Uh, uh, he was the impetus that pushed the Senate, the creation of the Senate forward. Excuse me? He was, his, it was his impetus that pushed the creation of the Senate forward. And it came about, the, the part that I remember, shortly after it may have been the same night as the, uh, as the infamous Academic Council meeting, there was a meeting of the AAUP, a dinner meeting, the annual dinner meeting. I think it was at uh, Ming's Restaurant. Those of you of a certain age will remember Ming's Restaurant. <laughs> and Herb was the speaker that night. Now Herb, those of you who remember him, was not only about the smartest person anybody ever met, he had about the most wicked tongue of anybody I ever knew. And he stood up and he said, I want to talk to you about this body and the Stanford faculty and what happened this afternoon. He said, I'll tell you what the Stanford faculty is like when it comes to managing this institution. He said, most of you faculty members are most concerned, in fact, primarily concerned with what you do in your own office, and your own classroom. You have some commitment and some concern for your department, fairly substantial, a little bit less, in fact, a lot less for your school. And I don't think you ever think about the university. And we've just witnessed the fact that you are responsible. That pattern of activity, that pattern uh, of the way faculty deal with their with their university was responsible for what happened this afternoon, and if that doesn't change, it's going to get worse well before it gets better. Leslie, behind you. Thank you. I'm Nan Cohen. I chaired the 13th Senate and left Stanford. That was not an easy decision right as my year concluded. And Bob and I are now back as visitors this winter and spring. I've very much enjoyed this program. I think it's a, a marvelous thing that the Historical Society has done to give us this book. It's full of memories, but also of wisdom about the faculty governance at this place. And having spent some time at four other institutions since I left, both on the administrative and the faculty side, I can say that this is a, a special distinctive and in many ways exemplary institution. For all the ups and downs, I think the Stanford Faculty Senate deserves a great deal of um, our admiration and gratitude for many reasons over the years. So I won't say any more today. I look forward to talking about the future at the next time we're together to think about this 50th anniversary. But certainly it would make no sense to talk about the future without having such a clear sense of the past. So we know what we're building on, what we have to work with, and perhaps something about where we're going from here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Ray Levitt, um, chair of the 45th Senate. And you know, unlike some other committees or organizations, we don't have a president-elect and a president emeritus to help coach the poor soul who becomes the <laughs> chair of the Senate or a chair-elect and a chair emeritus. And so the, that role is very admirably filled, I have to say, by the academic secretaries. There are several of them here. I had the privilege to work with Rex Jamison. Um, others of you have worked with others. But uh, the amount of advice and help and guidance that they and their staff, and I worked with Trish Del Pozzo, and if I needed to know something about the nuances of the history, as you say, she was an absolute uh, walking um, encyclopedia, uh, encyclopedia yeah. of what had happened at the university. So I'd like to personally express my appreciation for that function being filled, in fact, by the academic secretary and their staff. Uh, the other comment I'd like to share, just an anecdote. During my term, we were approached by um, a committee that had been formed, I think, from Arizona State originally called the PAC-12 Faculty Senate Chair Committee. Now, why the PAC-12 was a suitable peer group for academic senates to meet wasn't clear. You know, Utah and Colorado had just been brought into the PAC-12. But I decided to go to the meeting, 
And we were talking about comparative governance at different universities. And when I mentioned, first of all, that our president and provost came to the meeting and took unscripted or uh, prepared questions, people were aghast. When I told them that the president and provost had a higher attendance record than the average Senate member, they were even more aghast. <laughs> and so we really do have something unique here, and I, I appreciate the comments that have been made by Gerhardt and others about that. Thank you. Uh, I'm David Spiegel, chair of the 43rd Senate. I very much enjoyed uh, this discussion. And Susan, I have one suggestion. You should have spell checked Committee on Committees. We might have <laughs> come up with it better. Oh, um, yeah. It struck me as, as interesting in my own experience and in thinking about the history of the Senate that it started at a time of great turmoil, the 1968, and great turmoil on the campus and in the country. I wish there were more turmoil right now in the country, as a matter of time. Um, and, and some of the most memorable moments in my chairmanship and Rex uh, was my was the academic secretary then uh, was the decision about having ROTC come back to the campus, and it was a remarkable experience of going around hearing what students said, uh, chairing a very contentious but but disciplined, organized, respectful debate, and the students were models for respectfully disagreeing with one another. I wish people now paid that much attention to it. So I'm thinking of the Senate as kind of an implicit power structure rather than an explicit one. That is, it does, in fact, uh, very seriously discuss changes in, in uh, academic policy and in curriculum and required courses and all that, as it should. But it struck me that it was kind of available when needed when there were real stressors on the university. And so having this kind of steady force that doesn't try to run everything and couldn't if it wanted to, but is there when these kinds of issues come up, I think is a very valuable thing and one of the, the privileges for me of working with the Senate. I think that's absolutely true. You want it to be there when you need it. Maybe every year you don't need it, but when you need it, it's there. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Wasso, the current academic secretary, and I was chair of the, I don't know what Senate, 2003-2004. Um, both Peter and Gerhardt mentioned that the seating arrangement was important for making the uh, administrators seem like part of the faculty. And I wonder whether that's really the crucial factor um, it seems to me Stanford differs from most other universities in that uh, faculty members um, rotate in and out of academic, uh, sorry, out of administrative positions. You know, I've done, I did two deanships, uh, each one four years during my time as a faculty member here. Um, lots of other people uh, in this room probably uh, have rotated through administrative positions and then gone back to the faculty. Most institutions, I think it's a, uh, once you become an administrator, you're an administrator for life. <laughs> and that uh, creates more of a uh, us versus them sense. And I wonder whether that might not be more important than the seating arrangement. I know, Ethan, you might have something to say about that. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about seating arrangements at, at other institutions, but, but I think you're certainly on to something that there's something special here in terms of collegiality that is not echoed elsewhere. Uh, Pat Jones, I was chair in 93, 94. Um, so that's one thing I've thought about is this, uh, as we are celebrating our 50th anniversary, is... Uh, why the Senate works as well as it does and why Stanford's governance works as well as it does. And my sense is sort of following up on what Tom said is that it's been part of our culture since I've been here, and this is my 40th year at Stanford, that um, the president and provost recognize that they're part of the faculty and it's part of our culture for them to value, appreciate, and take advantage of the faculty in helping them govern the institution. So it's more of a partnership where there's a lot of mutual respect and traditionally the president and the provost have 
utilize the faculty to help them do their job of running the university. And so the mutual respect between the president provost and the faculty isn't then returned. Um, and I think that uh, has played a big role in why the Senate is successful and why our faculty governance is successful here. Uh, Tom, if I may, may say, uh, make one comment, uh, both you and Pat. Uh, I think you're making a very important point. Uh, though we have to be careful not to overstate Stanford's uniqueness in that. I mean, at the University of Chicago, which had a, an academic senate and a very similar governance structure, uh, the faculty also served in administrative positions, served as elected members, and there was a turnover at all times. But I do think, uh, when I think of you or of Pat, uh, it was very important to have senators who had actually administrative experience or who were about to do something of that kind. And uh, while I stress the symbolism of the alphabetic order, and that is a very powerful symbol, believe me. But uh, while I stress that, I think you made a very important contribution. The, the rather negative uh, aspect is, is uh, it, 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 the Senate represents and the people who are here represent the people who are, are willing to serve. I mean, it, it's uh, it, it's always a disappointment of, 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 of the percentage of people who vote for the Senate. So right. there's a lot of our colleagues who presumably have no interest, as long as they can get on with their work and so yeah. on. Right. Uh, but, you know, I think we're doing, uh, we can pat ourselves a bit on the back. That, that we're, we're doing important. We're, we're working on their behalf. I mean, they're still obviously very valuable uh, members of the community, but, but they do not are not at all interested in participating in faculty governance. But luckily, there are a sufficient number who are. Rosemary. So I'm Rosemary Knight. I chaired the 44th Senate, and to pick up a bit on that, I absolutely loved that experience. When the year I was chairing was the year we were revising our general education requirements, which is something I care deeply about. And the opportunity to work with my faculty colleagues and to address that key question, what is essential to education, it was absolutely fantastic. And I just want to say how much I appreciated the people I worked with, how much I appreciated these people you're describing who cared so much about the institution and that key question, what is essential? Why are we doing what we're doing? What should we really be teaching? It was an absolutely fantastic year. So I thank everyone I worked with that year. And Rex, right next door to me up there. So. Andrea. I think it's on. The 43rd, so that means I was chair of the 42nd, so thank you for <laughs> counting. Uh, I, in addition to being Senate chair, I just want to talk about the experience as a Senate member. I was elected to the Senate as an untenured faculty member. I didn't know you could say no when you were elected, <laughs> and my department chair told me you should have said no, and I'm glad I didn't know because serving in the Senate has been an honor and a privilege. It's given me um, access to people that care deeply about the university from all across the university. I've learned more about Stanford by serving in the Senate and a Senate chair than I could have learned any other way. And not only do we participate in governance, there are very specific things that we vote on and that we control. But uh, when I describe the Senate to other people, I say it's a bully pulpit. It's an opportunity for us to discuss things of importance. The first discussion about forming the ROTC committee was when I was Senate chair. And clearly, this is a very controversial topic. And the Senate was absolutely the right place to raise it. Um, we've talked about uh, so many different issues that go well beyond academic issues, well beyond the um, purview of the Senate to really talk about the soul of the university with people across the university that care about it. And to me, that has been the value of serving in the Senate is very much enriched my experience of being here. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so 
Um, I think, so I, I, came, I served on the Senate for 17 years in an ex officio way, and then for about five years uh, before that in, as a, an actual elected senator. So does anybody, can, has anybody been on the Senate more than that? Ooh. So, Simone, oh, put your hand up. Simone. Yes. Okay. Now, and, and one of... <laughs> so, so the one I've often wondered about the sense. I mean, I have the sense, and maybe this is wrong, and I have not had a lot of experience at other universities. But I have the sense that the there is a kind of collegiality between the the faculty and and the administration, particularly president, and provost, that is unusual, um, and. And I think it surprises a, a lot of people around the country. And I've wondered often what is the reason for that. And I, I do think it has something to do with the Senate. It has something to do with the sunshine too. But um, <laughs> and and but why? You know, people have mentioned a few things like the ability to ask the president a question every two weeks and so forth and so on. But that's not enough. I mean, in some sense. You know, most of the faculty are completely unaware of what goes on in the Senate. Most of the faculty are pretty oblivious about what goes on in the university as a whole. So I've decided that, let me throw out one other possible uh, reason for the collegiality. Any university has a group of potential rabble-rousing faculty, like Bob Simone and, and <laughs> Rob Polhamus and, you know. and. At Stanford, they get elected to the Senate, right? So they have an official way to, to rabble rouse. And I think that vents and allows, actually allows them to get to know the president and provost and vice versa and so forth and so on. And so maybe that's it. Maybe we just kind of concentrate our rabble rousers and put them all on the Senate. <laughs> There's another comment. I'm David Abernathy. I chaired the 81-82 Senate. In addition to affirming whatever what everybody else has said, I'd like to talk a little bit about the reasons for attending a Senate meeting. Um, one might not choose to do so, um, particularly in those times when the topic was rather boring. But in many cases, the topic was quite um, interesting. Uh, I was learning about the university. I didn't know much about it. And all of us are learning about other parts of the university. It was also a lot of fun to attend a meeting at, at, that, where, where the legendary Ken Arrow, Nobel Prize winner, was right there. This is a person who is who's right a few feet away from me. I could talk with that person. These people are smart as all get out. And so it's as fun to hear them deal with an issue. It's here, it, and it's fun to hear them have fun with an issue. We haven't talked about the humorous, aside from these little things at the end when we thank people and everybody laughed. But there was a lot of humor um, throughout these meetings, yeah. uh, helped by, for example, Gerhardt's self dismissive humor, et cetera. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, the rest of us had it too. Mm -hmm. And that meant that it was fun yeah. um, as well as instructive to attend the meeting of the Senate. Finally, the Senate was not just about Stanford as an institution. It was about this institution in the context of the country and the world. ROTC had to do with something bigger than us. Affirmative action had something to do with race relations, which is bigger than, than we are. The Reagan Library, et cetera. So you think of some of the issues the Senate addressed. They were the institution dealing with a part of the world outside of itself, which made another reason for being interested in attending its meetings. So, so now, I, unless there are, are there other comments there, I'd like to open it up to anybody else who has a question or a comment. Yes. First and then second. Okay. 
In the California State University system, which includes San Jose State and San Francisco State, separate from the University of California, if I remember correctly, the professors in that 23 campus system are members of an industrial labor union called the United Professors of California. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any other examples of labor union representation of faculty at public institutions, and when there is a union for the professors, how does that impact governance? Well, many universities, uh, uh, the AAUP, uh, 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 the chapter of the American Association of University Professors, serves as, in effect, a faculty union. I mean, I have no idea how many, but, but I think it's yeah. fairly common. It, it is common at, at public institutions, um, for sure. And, and many of those institutions have overlap with um, with institutions that have faculty senate. I profile the University of Utah in here, which is one that has a strong history of, of unions um, going back nearly a century, um, as well as a strong history of having a faculty senate. So they can coexist. Interestingly, in Washington State a few years ago, um, a bill passed the legislature to, um, to allow their public institutions to unionize uh, with the provision that they disband their faculty senates. This was passed by the legislature. Uh, the governor vetoed it. Uh, somebody got to him and explained why this was a problem. Um, but that's, that's how your, your ordinary elected official thinks, that these things are duplicative. At, at, at elite universities, uh, the members of the faculty quite correctly feel that they can do much better as independent contractors than <laughs> as union members. Another question or comment? Um, my <coughs> name is Ed Epstein, and I am a outlander in this gathering. I'm wearing a blue sweater. Does this give you a hint? Ah. I'm a professor emeritus at UC Berkeley, a visiting scholar here at Stanford for the last two years. And relevant to our discussion, in 1986 to 88, I chaired the Berkeley Academic Senate. Oh. And one of the things I was very interested in, obviously, is the difference, differences, similarities, and whether in the formation of Stanford Senate, uh, for good or for ill, Berkeley was something of a role model because we were right across the Bay and uh, given the relationship between the two institutions. What I want to say is, is this in terms of uh, Senate experience and with all res due respect to my uh, deceased friend and colleague Marty Tro, uh, uh, Sandra who's a historian of the Berkeley campus and I knew Marty very, very well. Uh, I don't believe Marty really believed that, uh, that uh, academic senates are useless. Um, I came, Berkeley's senate uh, goes back 100 years. And it grew out of crisis on the campus when there was a revolt of the faculty against uh, an autocratic, uh, autocratic president. And over the years, it, uh, its steel was tempered by such things as the oath controversy during the 1950s. Some of you may, may remember that. Very, very important. Where the Senate, um, uh, of course, opposed the uh, imposition of, uh, of a loyalty oath for faculty, uh, was not able to present it, but uh, articulate it, and also served as a, a backing for faculty members who, uh, who uh, refused to sign the oath. I'll jump forward to 1964, which is the year that both Gerhard and I, you came in 64, that's right, we both came in 64. Uh, professor <laughs> Epstein and I were both assistant professors 1964-66 at Berkeley, you remember. I fled Berkeley after that's two right. years. <laughs> <laughs> and um, louder, I will speak louder. 1964, was the uh, monumental change in American higher education. You had the free speech movement, which really opened up student protests, uh, participation. 
And I remember vividly, I'll never forget it, the academic senate meetings in the fall of 1964. In the senate uh, and various committees of the senate were very, very important in serving as mm -hmm. mechanisms to uh, provide, well, not accommodation, mediation, uh, not quite arbitration, but mediation between the administration, then inevitably the state became involved, and the students. And anyone who is present at, at that time would say that the Senate was a very important factor Mm -hmm. in achieving a uh, modus, modus vivendi. Uh, I can then uh, go forward to my own experience in 86, 88, where the hot issue on the campus was an American studies proposal, i.e., as some would say, an ethnic studies proposal. It's a very hot issue, an academic issue, but also one that had symbolism, had political, political ramifications within the uh, state. And I would say that the Senate, during my term and my successor's term, was able to come up with a academic uh, proposal that met Berkeley standards in terms of what legitimate courses are and was able to do this. One point here that, that's important uh, that I feel very strongly about. And that is the interaction of administration and the Senate. Um, I've seen times when there was very, very close relationship between the Senate, the chair of the Senate, and the chancellor of the uh, university, and times when this didn't exist. And those were not good times. And very recently, I won't mention names, but very recently we experienced this on the Berkeley campus. And this didn't uh, behoove well for either the Senate or for the then, uh, the then chancellor. Where it worked best was a very iterative relationship between the Senate and the administration and mutual success. But the last point I want to make is something that we didn't mention. And uh, well, by the way, in terms of faculty coming and going to administration and Senate, I mean, that's, that's the Berkeley tradition. I mean, people become deans, go back to the faculty. They become chancellors, go back to the faculty. I mean, it's, and uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's an important, uh, that's an important, uh, dimension here. So I think this is a wonderful gathering. Look forward to looking at, uh, at the book. And uh, uh, I must say, after nearly two years over here, it's not all bad at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <Sorry>. Jeff. <clears throat> Leslie. So thank you. I'm Jeff Kossif, and I've, I've been at Sanford for 35 years on the faculty, and Etch laid down a challenge. I was just looking through, and just, I went by, you know, the, the chairs, and I, I estimate I've been on the faculty center at least 20 of the 35 years, so. Uh, and then not as provost either, so. <laughs> but I just, I just want to say, make one point. I, I just, one uh, regarding the role of the academic secretary, and then one about what the Senate meant to me and what it has meant to me. And I remember the first year I was on, and Marion Lewinstein was the academic secretary, and she invited me to lunch. And she said, you know, okay, you're a freshman senator, frosh senator, you know, what was your experience like? And I made the big mistake of saying, uh, you know, I get them, I didn't know how the Senate worked. I didn't know there was a steering committee and stuff like that. I said, I get the impression sitting in the Senate that there are a few people who know what's going on, and the rest of us just haven't got a clue. <laughs> and she looked at me, and she said, hmm, you know. And the next thing, a week later, I get this call from the provost's office, and Condi invited me to come and meet with her to talk more about that. <laughs> so it, it, I thought, wow, that's, that's, uh, that, was quite, that left quite an impression on me. 
The thing that I want to say about the Senate and um, is there, and if you turn back the clock 15, 18 years when we started talking about interdisciplinarity and interdisciplinary uh, entities and institutes on campus, there were very few bodies on campus that existed that allow faculty from different disciplines and departments to come together and get to know each other in a real way. And the Senate really was, was one of the few. Mm -hmm. And the experience that I had being on the Senate and the relationships that I developed from being in the Senate were invaluable in ultimately developing the kind of connections that we needed to found the Woods Institute. And I just want to reflect on that because I think it was an incredibly, and it continues to be, a much underappreciated and very important role for the Senate. Thank you. Thank you.